today we're going to take the blinders off quantum states and with quantum eraser explore how orthogonal states aren't always exclusive <laughs> To start off, you're going to need to go to the movies. Actually, all you need are a pair of these real 3D, 3D glasses. You could try and use regular polarized sunglasses from the store, but the problem is that the polarizers that we're after are sandwiched between two little pieces of plastic that makes it really hard to get to. Whereas with these, you can do this. This is actually a linear polarizer and a circular polarizer sandwiched together. Now, if you're careful, you can actually peel these apart. Ah, uh, ooh, aha. Uh -huh. Ah. Of course, they get a bunch of stick -em on them. I'm going to use this uh, nail polish remover for because it's got acetone in it. You know what? I take it back. Screw the acetone. It's not working and smelling horrible. Use isopropyl alcohol. Now I do have to abrade it pretty well, but after a little bit of rubbing, I can get it to be clear. So while I'm doing this, let's review about polarizers. Classically, that is not quantum physics, a polarizer is a device that can only pass light if the electrical field of that light is moving in a certain way. In linear polarizers, there are conductive strips that absorb and reflect light with polarization in line with these strips, while light with a different angle for the electric field can squiggle past, while a circular polarizer is a material that delays or slows the electrical field by one quarter the wavelength of the light, which causes the electric field to spiral either clockwise or counterclockwise in relation to the direction the light is traveling. Once you have your polarizer lens pieces at least reasonably clean, you're going to need to get out the uh, ever trusty toy laser. You're going to want to arrange your linear polarizers so that they can black each other out. This is sort of like cross hatching because the lines of going one way and the lines going the other way completely stop any light that's coming through here. You can keep that black. Then simply take your laser and shine it through or attempt to shine it through. If I put the laser here, I can still shine it up onto the camera. If I put it down here, nothing gets through. What's interesting is when you take one of these clear pieces, which is actually a circular polarizer and insert it in between, you're able to get light again. Boom. Boom. Yeah. So to explain what's going on here, I'm going to use Dirac notation, otherwise known as bra-ket notation, and it's called that because it uses objects called bras and objects called kets, bra, ket, bracket. No, I'm not making a pun. That's actually what it's called. Now, a normal state for a quantum thing, usually called the system, is defined by a ket. You'll notice that this notation kind of looks like an arrow or a pointer, and that's on purpose because it's symbolically pointing to the way that a quantum thing, a quantum system, can be. It could point to a photon being vertically polarized, horizontally polarized, circular polarized, happy, sad, or less than three. Look, it doesn't matter what you put inside of the ket. It just symbolizes the state that the quantum thingy is in. And the set of allowed emoji that you put into this ket represent the space of states, that is, the world of possible things that it could be. Fortunately for us, at each point in our setup, there's only two possible states that it could be at any given time. First, the laser light comes in and it's either vertically polarized or horizontally polarized. If it makes it through the first one, then it becomes either circularly right or circularly left, and then vertical horizontal again when you get to the other side. For this example, we can write out a map that represents the complete set of emoji for each one of the states, and you only need two points on that map. So for the horizontal ket vector, you're going to have two spaces and you're going to have a one for this state and a zero for this one. That means it's horizontal. It's pointing to this pattern or arrangement of information. Whereas for the flipped state, the vertical polarizer, we would signify it this way in the ket and then we would write a zero 
and then a 1. Now, what about those circular polarizers? It'd be nice if we could write the representation for the circular polarizer onto the same map where you just have those two states, because it's either clockwise or counterclockwise, but you want it to be able to kind of fit together with all of the other two states that you have going on, and you can do this. What you get is this. Yeah, that i is the imaginary i of the square root of negative 1, and yeah, we have a square root of 2 in the bottom, an irrational number, and while it looks really awkward, it actually makes sense. The reason for this is math. If you really want to know why those are the numbers, I suggest you go and you watch the videos by Leonard Susskind on quantum mechanics. He does this exact example on the board. We're almost there. We have a way of writing down the quantum state that it's in, but we need a way of writing down how it interacts with other states or moves from one state to another. And that's where the bra part of the bra ket notation comes in, and that's also where quantum probability starts showing up. So when we send the laser light through this first polarizer, a lot of the laser light is bouncing back because it's not perfectly polarized, but a fair bit of it is getting through. So this light that gets into here has already been pre-programmed into the state of horizontally polarized. So we will write down first the ket for horizontal polarization. Next, we want the probability of how much light is going to make it through this second polarizer, the vertical polarizer. For that, we write down a bra, the bra of bra ket notation, and it looks almost like the ket for a vertical polarizer, except the arrow is pointing the other way. Now, the arrow pointing the other way has a technical meaning. It means it's been complex conjugated. For simple states, it doesn't really change much, but for more complex states, that means specifically states that involve the imaginary number i, it can change them quite a lot. So now we place the bra next to the ket. Now if we take this object, this gives us what is known as the probability amplitude, sort of the size of the probability, but not literally the probability. In matrix form, you would have something that is like this. Notice that the bra is written horizontally where the ket is written vertically. So you just multiply this number by this number and write it down, and then you add this number by this number and write it down, and you end up with zero, which is obvious because it's, well, pretty much black. To get the actual probability, I would have to multiply that number by its complex conjugate, but complex conjugating a zero doesn't really change anything. The fact that we got a zero or black means that these states, horizontal and vertical, are what is known as orthogonal. Now, orthogonality in geometry just means that there are right angles to each other, but in this context, it means that they can't be measured by the same experiment. I have to be measuring either this or this, and if I try to do both at the same time by shining this light through, well, it doesn't make it. What about when we stuck that circular polarizer in between? So to get the probability for the first half of this arrangement, we start with the state that it made it through the first horizontal polarizer, and then we take the bra of the circular polarizer and combine them together. Working this out in terms of the matrix relationship, you end up with this number, which is, gotta check my notes which is just 1 over square root of 2. Then we multiply that by its complex conjugate, because it has no i's in it, you just end up squaring it, and you end up with 1 half. So half of the light, essentially, from here makes it to here. Then we take the state of it being here, that is, the circular polarized state, and make that our new ket. And we take the vertical polarizer and put that again as the bra. Again, we're going to multiply all of this stuff through in terms of the matrix arrangement, and when you do that, you end up with i over the square root of 2 as the probability amplitude. That i is a little bit confusing, but that's why you have to multiply by the complex conjugate. What you end up doing is you multiply this number by minus i over the square root of 2, and that adds up to, again, half. Now, if I take the probability that it got from 
through this polarizer, I multiply it by the probability to get through this polarizer, I get my final answer, which is one quarter, or 25% of the light makes it from here to here. But we can be more quantitative than that. Okay, with my impromptu light meter, I'm gonna go ahead and measure what's going on here. But to avoid any spurious signals, I'm gonna have to dim the lights a bit. So first level, so it comes through here. About five, six millivolts. So it comes through here, about no millivolts. Now I'm gonna put in the circular polarizer. It's in there. There it is, 1.5. Somewhere between 1 and 1 1.5 for the first two. Now if I try to do all of them, I should be getting, oh, there it is, 0.7. Just about a volt is getting through. Just about a quarter of the voltage that it got when it went through the first light is what was getting through on the final setting, which is exactly what the theory predicted. But we can do one better. Here is my final card. This is set up almost identically to the way that I did um, my first quantum experiments video, um, which you can see a link to here. I'm gonna see if I can show you the way that the polarizers are set up in this thing. It's horizontal. There's vertical, right? So the light that's coming through it, I'm blocking it with this little polarizer here. Anyway, you can see that there are two slits and that the polarizer um, has, has been covered over carefully on top of these slits, linearly one way this way and linearly the other way this way. Wow, I'm not wearing my glasses. I knew there was something fishy going on. There, now you look like, now I look like me and you look like you. So over here, I have my laser turned on permanently and my specialized double slit that has the different polarizers on each side. And it's shining all the way over here onto the wall. If there was a diffraction pattern, I'd be seeing it right here on the wall and you'd be seeing it right here on the wall and there's nothing. Now if I take one of these circular polarizers I should be able to restore the interference pattern. Oh, is that it? Or is that just junk on the thing? Let's try the regular polarizer. Come on. Oh, <gasps> that's totally it. Oh my word. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, the interference is there, not there. That's definitely interference. I think it definitely works better with this one, which is the same polarizer, the exact same polarizer that I cut up for that piece. Oh, that's it. Over the hard part, getting it on camera. All right, so again, I'm doing weird low light situations so that maybe you can see this thing here, what I'm going to be doing, because you won't be able to see when it's off, is just rotating this regular linear polarizer in front of the laser. So here it is. I have the same setup as before where my laser is more than two meters away and it has a linear polarizer going one direction over one of the two slits and a linear polarizer going the other way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold, now that is me holding the linear polarizer one way. You see how it's blocking up part of the light and the light is spreading out and now I took it away. Now I'm going to put it in at 90 degrees to that and again you'll see it's a different blob and then if I carefully turn it to exactly a 45 degrees you can see just barely you can see the interference pattern reappear. Now that is quantum erasure. 
If you don't know, a quantum eraser is when you somehow mark the particles as they go through a multipath or two-slit arrangement. In this case, the marking is done with the orthogonal polarizers over each slit. This hides the interference pattern that you would normally see in a simple double-slit experiment. However, when you add in a polarizer at 45 degrees, it is said that the which path marker is erased and the interference pattern returns, though dimmer by the appropriate probability. In this case, half as bright. Along with being totally unintuitive, this shows that while orthogonal states like our crossed polarizers aren't always exclusive, that is, you can think of the horizontal and vertical polarization as being built out of plus and minus 45 degree polarization, or circular ones for that matter. Conversely, the 45 degree polarization state is a combination of vertical and horizontal ones. And when you combine these states in just the right pattern, you can let light through that otherwise wouldn't, as in our first experiment, or restore an interference pattern that would otherwise be hidden, shown here. It's pretty freaking phenomenal. Anyway, I hope this was interesting. I know it was a lot to digest with throwing the math in there as well as two experiments, but I originally I was just gonna show the, uh, the first part, but I was messing around on Reddit and there was a subreddit where there were people asking for people to do experiments or recreate experiments, and I got a link to uh, this video here where they showed it with a, a you know, with lab quality equipment um, in a classroom setting. Um, but I felt like I could probably pull it off and it was a very finicky experiment. If you wanna try this one out, be prepared to be frustrated and try doing things over and over and over again to really get it right. But it's really cool. I mean, you saw me cooing and hollering and everything. Like it's really, real how the physics works. You can see it with your own eyes and you can test it with things that you can get with your own hands. It's not like you have to go and, you know, find some sort of special laboratory that has a, you know, a light table and has specialized polarizers and, you know, helium lasers and all sorts of crazy equipment. You can do it for what? This, this was free. This was, you know, maybe a buck worth of tape, and this was like a buck, two bucks of a laser. It's really not that hard to try and get a hold of this kind of equipment, and it's amazing what it can do. But you don't have to take my word for it because you can science it. Yeah. Oh look, it's focusing. My camera's focusing on the, Ooh. Can't see it. It's focusing on Matt Damon's face.